Good morning. Welcome to San Augustine First UMC. I'm your pastor, Pastor Tim Turner. We're going to try something new today. We're recording here in the sanctuary. Shout out to Norman Neal. Thanks for helping put this together and figure out how to record in here. Let's start by singing a well-loved song together. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus and to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise. God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Well, friends, this morning, we're going to be looking at a passage from 1 Kings. If you want to go ahead and turn to 1 Kings chapter 17, we're continuing our hospitality series with a passage from 1 Kings chapter 17. So I'm going to read that passage, 17, 8 through 16. Hear the word of God. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, saying, Go now to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and live there. For I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he set out and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the town, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and said, Bring me a little water and a vessel so that I may drink. As she was going to bring it, he called to her 
and said, Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. She said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of meal in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I'm now gathering a couple of sticks that I may go home and prepare, prepare it for myself and for my son that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, do not be afraid. Go and do as you've said, but first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me and afterwards make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of meal will not be emptied and the jug of oil will not fail until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. She went and did as Elijah said, so that she, as well as her, her household and her son, ate for many days. The jar of meal was not empty, neither did the joy, jug of oil fell, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. A never-ending supply. I mean, have you ever seen God work in, in such miracle-working ways? Here we find ourselves in the story in this ancient land, the ancient land that's once known as the Fertile Crescent. It's a land supposedly flowing with milk and honey, the land that was of God's promise, the land of pl plenty. But add a few decades of sin-stained choices to the mix, and, and Elijah, in our story, is wandering in a barren wilderness in days of drought. Now, we've been to the barren wilderness before, haven't we? He wanders in search of life, and, and Elijah roams trying to save his own skin. He's trying to save his own skin from, from an angry mob of corrupt leaders that like to skin him alive. Because you see, Elijah is the prophet of Israel. Elijah is the mouthpiece of God Most High. And Elijah warned those leaders that like to skin him alive, turn from sin, or this land will see drought. This land will swirl in its own sin sickness, its own life-straining choices if you don't turn. But those leaders that like to skin him alive, they instead chose to sink even further into sin. And that's where our story begins. Our story begins in that kind of barren wilderness place, wandering in the middle of a drought. In fact, our story begins as God tells Elijah to make a move. He says, flee to Zarephath, a place that was in the foreign land of Sidon. Listen again to verse 8. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, saying, Go now to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and live there. For I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he set out and went to Zarephath. Now, I wonder from Elijah's perspective how, how strange he must have felt as he heard coming from God, our provider, those instructions. I mean, Elijah knows he needs the Lord's provision. He knows he needs a word from God, but this is a strange word that God gives. Did you hear the strange word? Widow. That's the strange word. And you ask, now, now why would that be the strange word in the story? You see, in the ancient Near East, widows had no social safety. Without a husband, a widow could easily have fallen into abject poverty. I mean, we see that with Ruth. We see that with Naomi. Women in those days had such limited ways to support themselves. And Elijah would have known full well. Now, if I'm suffering, surely the widow suffers even more. I mean, Elijah trusted God, yeah. But I still see in my mind's eye a shocked kind of look in his eyes when, when God tells him, don't worry. 
God says, a foreign widow who does not know either you or me, that's who's going to provide your needs. And I just picture Elijah, what? And Elijah, he trusts God, though. He still makes that long trip to Sidon. And the story picks, picks back up at the front gate of the town. This is verse 10 again. Now when Elijah came to the gate of the town, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and he said, bring me a little water and a vessel so that I may drink. As she was going to bring it, he, he called to her and said, bring me a morsel of bread in your hands. But she said, as the Lord your God lives, I've got nothing baked, only a handful of meal in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I'm now gathering a couple of sticks so that I may go home, prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. Now, if it was me, that, that would be the moment when I'd really start to question if I heard from God or if I heard from the pizza last night. Because can you even imagine, can we even imagine being in Elijah's shoes as he hears this word from God, the widow will provide for your need. And not only that, can we imagine being in Elijah's, shoe, Elijah's shoes when the widow tells us this story? I mean, here he shows up in town not knowing anyone from Adam. Does he even know that this is the widow that God has called to provide for his needs? And the audacity Elijah has, right? I mean, to a complete stranger, he says, Fetch me some water and some bread. But then the, the shoe drops. The widow responds with that heart-wrenching story. I'm gathering sticks to bake the last meal I'll ever eat. How could God be calling this poverty-stricken widow, who literally stands on death's door, by the way, to be the person who provides Elijah's needs. And if I'm in Elijah's shoes, my heart drops when I hear the widow's response. And yet Elijah seems to see some kind of larger vision of God at work because he says this to the widow. Do not be afraid. Go and do as you've said, but first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me and afterwards make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of meal will not be empty, and the jug of oil will not fail until the day that the Lord sends rain on the earth. Now here's where the widow needs faith. The whole story shifts as we try to see things from her perspective. I mean, if we thought we th that things looked strange from Elijah's perspective, just wait till we, we put ourselves in her shoes. Because she does not worship Elijah's God. In fact, you heard me point it out. She calls God, your God, to Elijah there in verse 12. God is not her God. But now Elijah's God calls out to her. God gives her a chance to step out in faith. God gives her a chance to find grace. And it's radical I mean, she's literally about to starve to death, and a complete stranger asks for her last loaf of bread. But if Elijah speaks truth, and if she has faith in this foreign God, apparently the jar will never go empty. I mean, but what a ludicrous idea if we're really trying to hear it from her Point of view. I mean, what if we step outside? Let's just step outside of the story for a moment. Really try to get down deep in this widow's shoes. There's plenty of people who go to bed hungry every night, even right here in the U.S., even right here in San Augustine. In fact, you can look it up. The Temple Foundation, they, they did a study only two years ago, 2019. And it showed that 31% of children in San Augustine County have food insecurities. 31%. That's about one in every three children who go to sleep hungry most nights 
And that's not across the sea. That's right here in our own backyard. Now in Elijah's story, the, the widow tells Elijah she plans to make that last loaf of bread for her and her son. The very next story calls, calls that son a child. A child small enough to carry close to your chest. And here's where the story really hits home for me. What if God called you or me to go ask the nearest widow gathering meager sticks to go make us a sandwich? And what if that widow looked back in our eyes and said, I've only got four slices of bread. I've only got enough meat for two. This was the last meal we had for the month. And what if that child happened to be standing on the front porch, tattered clothes, skin and bones, eyes a bit sunken? It's a scene we prefer to imagine across the pond, not, not here in the U.S., but it's actually a scene from just down the street. And actually, I wonder more what it looks like from the widow's perspective. What does it feel like when this man of God asked her to give him her last loaf of bread? See, to me, the most shocking part of the story really isn't the never-ending job. The most shocking part of the story to me is that this foreign widow gives everything to trust the hand of a God she barely even knows. Look with me at verse 15. She went and did as Elijah said, so that she, as, as well as he and her household, ate for many days. The jar of meal was not empty, neither did the jug of oil fell, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. You know, through that widow's faith, through that widow's radical hospitality, God not only provided for her and her son, but God also provided for Elijah through her hands. You know, in many ways, when I see myself in Elijah's shoes, I quickly count out both the widow and the grace of God far too early. You see, when I step into the story, my first thought is, how does she have anything to offer? You know, my first thought really is, she needs more from me than I need from her. And when Elijah's shoes, I somewhat see myself as the only one God can work through. The audacity, right? I mean, here I am, convicted head to toe when I read this story simply because I put myself in the prophet's shoes and see myself looking down on this poverty-stricken widow. Who am I to limit God's grace, though? Who am I to think that a person down on their luck can't offer the world anything but needy hands? Who am I to think that God can only work through my hands? But Elijah seems to know God differently. Elijah fully believes that God can and will bring sustaining, life-giving grace through the hands of the widow. And if God wants to bring life through the hands of someone knocking on the door of death, who really am I to slow God down anyway? In fact, when I stop and think about it, Shouldn't we expect God to be in the business of bringing dead things back to life? Shouldn't it really, should it really be all that shocking to us that, that God wants to offer life-giving redemption to someone hungry and in desperate need of hope? Should that really be shocking to us? I mean, it surprises me that God sends Elijah to find life and grace at the home of a destitute widow, but why? I mean, shouldn't we expect our God of resurrection life to be bringing hope and grace to places marked by death? 
Shouldn't we expect to find our God already at work inside him? In fact, Jesus makes the same exact point when he preaches on this same passage while passing through his hometown of Nazareth. The people in the synagogue on that day, they wanted healing and grace and miracles, but they didn't want to follow Jesus to the homes of the people who needed that grace the most. And Jesus connects this story from 1 Kings with a word from the prophet Isaiah. He says in Luke 4, verse 18, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he's anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's grace. And then he looks those synagogue officials in the eyes and he says, friends, that's what I'm all about. That's what my life is all about. He closes the scroll. He sits down. You know, in my life, it's often been shocking to me where we find God's grace the most. I mean, sometimes we find God's grace at a table gathered around with friends, but oftentimes we find God's grace in places that at first we might consider radical. You know, in my own life, in my own journey, I find that I've met God more clearly and more deeply in places that first felt dark to me than in places that already had the light. You know, semin seminaries and, and sanctuaries, they, they can be shining lamps on a hill. And that's what we aim for, after all, is to be a shining lamp on the hill. But I've come to realize that just as Jesus chose to embrace our death and our darkness, so too is God in the business of bringing light to those dark places. In fact, it's often in those dark places where I've seen the light most clearly. You know, I find it both compelling and beautiful that God would bring that life and that light, not first through Elijah's hands like we'd expect, but rather through the widow's hands. And perhaps that's what seeing the world as God sees the world is, is really all about anyway. Maybe it's not just about what we can offer, where we can go, or what we can bring to the table. Maybe it's about seeing each and every person as a potential vessel of God's life, God's light, and God's grace. And so this morning, I praise God. I praise God that no matter how little we feel we can bring, and no matter how big we think we are, God always keeps lifting lifting us up from death to life. God always keeps bringing grace in places we least expect. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. I want to sing one more song together. I think you know this one. It's a good one to finish with. Let's pray and praise God together. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like ever before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy Yes, the Lord of my 
people of God, and a prayer for us this week is that we are given new vision by God. That we might see God's grace in places and in ways that we never even imagined we'd see God's grace. Maybe it's in a person we least expect to find God's grace. And yet God's already there working in their lives, I fully believe. Or maybe it's in a place or in a way that we're not entirely sure God can work in that way. I pray that we see God's grace in new ways this week. May we go in God's grace and God's peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit.